So I say um, thank you for the invitation. I I just I just came back from teaching an eight day workshop in Milan, and you know remembered that I'm not a teacher, and so um, in a way, uh, yeah, the sense of these short change students who are um, studying within practice and the value of the teacher, because. Um, I think ultimately we're the ones who'll be learning tomorrow, so that's um, that's all good, isn't it? Generous. So I, I've come very uh, obediently to take on this challenge of an anxiety, I think, between that moment of flipping um, research, so-called research, to proposition, and um, it's something that can take you know a year of understanding a place but also it is in the moment of looking, and that close looking, as recorded in drawing, or the, the suggestion that drawing is also um, a state of mind. So I'm gonna show you very few drawings, but it's all about drawing, what, what I'm presenting. So this is a one-to-one -one drawing um, by some students from Central St. Martins um, in the Medieval and Renaissance galleries at the Victoria and Albert Museum, where they drew the uh, minimum space standards from the London Housing Design Guide onto the floor of Medieval and Renaissance Gallery. So on the left you have a single bedroom, and then the dotted line is a double bedroom, and on the right a hallway and stairs. And what happens is in, the, is in those um, loose moments where you find yourself, for example, with the minimum standards for a classroom for 30 children captures a Renaissance fountain where one can ask why not. And I think that sense of um, what you're drawing and what you're drawing into your projects and then giving that some territory is um, a good way to go. So um, starting off with a drawing not by us and wondering why there's so few drawings in this presentation. And I think it's because of a wariness of the role that drawing can have in lying. Yeah, the lies of drawing. So this is, um, this, this is a drawing which might, which unlike the, um, the credible possibilities of lying a naked figure across a bit of London, this is instead of the lying laying onto London, is just the protruding, protruding and extruding up. So this is the Whitechapel vision as drawn by BDP um, for a moment in London Borough of um, Tal Hamlet's history of the opportunities of um, Crossrail. And what you can see here is um, a not drawing, because what is not drawn is really almost anything that's there. But when we then, um, our tendency, our model for the office is when we see a brief like this one, utterly toxic, to draw the detailed design for the Whitechapel vision, its very toxicness becomes a reason to get the job. And perhaps what we've learned is to keep our mouth buttoned for the interview and to not get sacked in the first month so that we can make an alternate um, critique. And so it was the mode of architectural drawing which allowed us to make a space for, for those officers to say goodbye to the Whitechapel vision. And this was a drawing by Fenner, Wagner, working with us, where all she did was to draw on the shadows and draw the thing which was missing. And it's at this moment that you realize that um, planning departments without enough planners who cannot draw are utterly um, handicapped. And you, as architects in the making, I, I, I cheated our fellow teachers, because I wrote an email to all of the students who were in my workshop, even though they might have all now decided to be Nigels or think it looks more fun, but um, asking what they're interested in. And quite a lot of them are interested in this idea of the architect as agent of social change, of um, working the public realm, and, and really don't dismiss what you have, the tools you already have, for example, of making visible what that drawing was not saying. And I sort of thought, why is it um, 
that, uh, you know, why is this anxiety perhaps a freehand drawing? And I think just like look at those pictures that in master planning, the thicker the felt pen, you know, it's he who holds the pen who can determine the road which crosses this part of the city is uh, these hands that sort of take space across the drawing is perhaps why drawing becomes a more covert operation. So this, I counted a drawing. So this is a drawing that um, we were invited to, uh, to make a poster for 2017. And so we made the scientific one about where we try to make the work. So if at the bottom is complicity of the really dodgy territory that you put yourself into and the compromises that you have to make of attempting to make some good contributions. And I suppose this is, you know, uh, Nigel used that word mood, you know, the mood of the time that he was working. I really see this, uh, this duck and diving with complicity as, as one way of taking the mood of now, you know, of, of uh, negotiations between um, private investment and the attempt to keep doing what Muff has always done is that we just started with the foolhardy statement that we would make our work in the public realm. And that is our continuing research question, is this project of the public realm? <coughs> so I'm then, then going to jump to the thing that Nigel particularly actually is most anxious about, about too much research. You know, too much research will be just the loving, sort of remaining with the most incidental detail, which means that you as students will not be brave in your proposition. So I was going to start with one of these dangerous projects, this is old, where this is the photograph from the site visit to an empty space in Tilbury in the far east of London, where we noticed that there was something which wasn't in the brief, namely horse dung in the playground. Nobody had mentioned the horses. And I think the jump is, is what happens to that first observation? Does it stay at the scale of the thing? Or does it become a paradigm for moving with? So in the case of that project, in the um, research phase, we made room for the horses. We made room for the horses at the scale of a formalized taking up of space of the Gymkhana and then the setting it as a bigger question about territory, which applied as much to young people as to that horse. And that then became formally described in the design for the project, where spaces were made at the scale of the horse arena, but also a space big enough for football, but without football goals, so that other things could happen there. So this idea of... Um, taking seriously the value of coast looking and that becoming a paradigm which you can make um, a project with is this shift where observation becomes proposition and the recognition that however hard you try you're not describing everything there's always an act of editing and that act of editing is propositional you know, there, there is the voice and so, yeah, in the final project, room was made for the horse and room was made for hanging out. And in time, the horse is left and there's still this area which in a way is um, marked off for, marked off for use. And so I'm um, thinking about LSA and the model that you operate on of sitting in other people's rooms, doing their work for them, how do you develop your own voice? You know, how are you not as schizophrenic as um, to, in a kind of episodic way, take on the rep modes of representation, the modes of drawing, the modes of design of who's paying you or who your tutor is? And so I think, you know, I can describe for myself in practice that drawing is a kind of protective territory. You know, sitting in the most painful of meetings that have to be sat through in order to make a project, um, all I do is draw. And that drawing actually is thinking, and it means that two thoughts can coexist. So I'm sure none of your employers are in this room, but you know, you can steal your time when you're there 
They, they are paying you to make your project. You know, whether you're making your notes in your own margin or in the projects you're doing. So these, these two images come from Renaissance books where there was this whole discipline of marginalia. Can you see the little fingers pointing to a particularly interesting point of text? Or this moment when the, the doodle or the, the thing inspired becomes bigger than the text itself. A sort of commentary where um, Brodsky says, you know, history's written in the footnotes. You know, the, the footnotes become the project. And um, this is just to prove that I draw. This is the only drawing you're going to see. But, um, but in, you know, in the, these, are, these are all just from uh, meeting drawings. Where well, I'm drawing something completely different to the meeting I am in. Or, you know, just a single two words, like the words public betterment. Working in a very loaded project for Hackney of building um, a new social housing project, which is being knocked down. I suppose one not this time, I think. But it's, not being, uh, it's going to be knocked down as part of the compulsory purchase order. If you do that, it has to be for public betterment. Suddenly, these two words can become the reason for doing everything we do in the future. Um, so. I think I just want to go back to this notion of close looking, of observation as becoming the proposal, and it being like a magician's sleight of hand where observation becomes the proposal. So I'm not going to see too many kind of, and this is a picture of this, those pictures exist, it's got this is a snappy presentation. So for example, in Marking Town Square, the thing you notice can be the thing that's absent. So how do you draw the thing that is not there? And in the case of Barking Town Square, this is a project built over five years in a period of time after there's been no private investment in Barking as a place for 60 years. And the clawing and creating of shared civic space came at the price of each group of 300 private dwellings. So we made a project which could be read as one project, but in, which was a jigsaw of pieces, you know, deal, deal piece by piece. And so it was articulated as simply as possible as um, an open, hard landscape, which was big enough for activities to happen. Um, a civic route back to a shopping street, uh, a space filled with mature trees, and holding the two spaces, a mirroring of the temple steps. So this sort of fantasy that we could create a new civic realm, which was equal, but other to um, the town hall. Our original brief was for an L-shaped space, and we deliberately were able to be sort of given a little triangle, which made the L-shape became, uh, the T-shape became an L-shape. And so our first work was as bland as it could possibly be. This was the early stage before getting sacked. This is the early stage <laughs> in not to be sacked, where you make things that are almost nothing to argue with. So here, the only argument was whether Spanish granite was really necessary rather than Chinese granite. It was. We had to go to the quarry. We had to take everybody to the quarry because the act of collecting the stone, you can argue, was both um, ecologically sound, but it forced us kind of spending time together and getting it. And secondly, these um, pale pink timber benches, which were the location for anxiety. So making room for, for others' anxiety. The anxiety was what would people do if they could sit down in a public space? There was anxiety about things being set on fire, names being um, driven and carved into the, the, any object you might put there. And that's why we chose timber, because we said when it gets burnt, we can just sweep away the ashes. So we're sort of making a space for anxiety, which I see as a form of drawing. You know, you draw out that space for that anxiety to happen. And at the same time, we were able to build the thing missing from this fast, planar, white, clean, cheerful architecture which covered East London um, from the mid-2000s, 
with its opposite, and the opposite was a folly full of the thing that was not present, i.e. a kind of continuous relationship with history and the loss of manual skill. So this constructed additional facade, which could complete this square, and necessary, and sit opposite the benches, which nobody had set a like to or even carved their name, um, and act as a sort of memento mori to the new development, the idea that one day you will be a ru ruin too, was us drawing out with what was not present and um, placing it in place. And what happened was over time, the anxiety about what public territory, shared territory might look like receded, because of course it would do, it was just fear of the unknown. And our developer came pretty upbeat with making many places to sit amongst mature trees, which, um, like Nigel, the value of theatre, you know, the value of buying a 20-foot tree that looks as if it's always been there is um, worth every penny and actually doesn't cost very much at all. So that instant premature gratification, as Capshon Field described it, and this is the last of the five pieces when the idea of children, which had been an anathema on day one, are able to be given status to. There, it's kind of interesting, I didn't make the hand drawn <coughs> version of this presentation, but of course somewhere there are drawings of each stage of what's missing. And this idea of um, landscapes, as, as much um, it exists, for interior landscapes, and so this is just very quickly um, the Science Museum, where the attempt was to make, again, a shared territory of um, exploring that was non-linear and non-instrumental. This is where Muff's work starts to go into dodgy ground, because is this a public space? You have to buy a ticket here, unless you're a school child. So this, you know, if we're looking for the, the sellout we're finding, we're beginning to enter into it. Because although, like barking, we were tempting to make somewhere mysterious and open to a very <coughs> physical exploration. And so, in a way, we wrote our own get out, which is the fact that this is the pay line. Yeah, this is the pay line of the project. And we were able to um, take on territories outside the pay line and in the case here, of just thinking about the line that's drawn and the space that's left over after the drawing, which was, um, had been described as circulation, non-space, and in this case became the place that the children, school children, because um, 200,000 school children a year do go there free. And so we kind of flipped our emphasis of finding our public to the school children so that their place of being briefed, i.e. the space left around that theatre, was wrapped in a um, quilted blanket and made, I think, one of the most glorious spaces in the Science Museum, top lit and um, huge and expansive. So that idea of expanding a brief. So how do you keep kind of observing if you're not, if you find yourself more and more trying to put your creativity into making a territory that is meaningful for a project, how do you bring that necessary um, accuracy? Because I think what I'll say to you is that it's your writing of your brief is where the proposal starts. So you start by expanding the brief, it's already the research is framed by the question. And if you take somebody else's brief, the recognition is that that brief is incomplete. So in the case of Barking Town Square, the brief was to make um, a public space where people could sit in the sun. The nature of the eight story buildings meant that half of that public space was not in the sun, and that's why we filled it with mature trees. The reaction was, you know, if it's gloomy, make it more gloomy. It make it mysterious. So equally, how do you expand that to incomplete brief? And so this idea that the, um, the sign of good research 
is getting sufficiently deep into a situation. So I notice in the, is that some of you are working in East London high streets, other of you are hanging around in Soho, is, you know, is, is the getting close and this gathering. And so um, Clifford Getz described this as deep hanging out. The moment that people don't notice you, that you're no longer observing, because you've found a place for yourself in that situation. But the question is that architects, when they're working at a certain scale, tend to spend more time of, them, of, of more of their time either in architects' offices or in their clients' rooms. So how, at that point, can you possibly expand that brief with that precision of no, uh, understanding what is missing or what hasn't been articulated? And I suppose at this point, I'd say that part of making proposals is the understanding of how to um, expand that brief and who and, and making mechanisms, designing the mechanisms for other voices other than your own to be heard, to, to actually um, enrich the situation. And I suppose that's what we attempted to do with the um, when we. Um, authored the British Pavilion in Venice in 2010 was started with the premise that given the British have always been obsessed with Venice, the best thing to put into the pavilion would be <coughs> Venice itself. And so we did so by spending all the budget in Venice, building the piece in Venice, and making room for um, the what's left of the population, there's now 60,000 people, of when you have not very many people, the arguments get even louder to come together and to make a kind of shared territory for them to do so. And we did it with um, an architectural model. So this is a one to ten um, model of a fragment of the Olympic Stadium built from the um, steelwork shop drawings and then repurposed into a drawing studio. And we called this the Stadium of Close Looking. The idea that you can keep jumping at two scales, from what you understand at one-to-one -to, -one, to your big ideas for a place. And that if you root it um, in the particular, those strategies are more likely to um, sing. <coughs> and so I'd say that use is also another form of drawing. So this um, is a poster from 1969. Does everyone read French? Sufficient French? Yeah. So the crèche is in the director's office. You know, what does that mean? So when you write these words on your plans describing the programmes that you're proposing, you know, what does that mean? It might just mean it's a baby sitting underneath the director's desk, or it means a completely set of new rules for an institution, or it's a new set of ancillary spaces off the director's office. And so those different um, gradients of proposal to realize your um, proposition is kind of what you're working with at present. Um, I feel like the afternoon's gone on quite a long time. So the theoretically, it's not that much longer, is there? Of your... Of, my, of the whole afternoon. Uh, you've got... Uh, Just checking five it. Five minutes. Yeah, okay. So, um, also I think there's a real value <coughs> in a literalness, a kind of stupid obedience of seeing it through. So, just as Rus as um, Venice ended six years ago, we got invited to pitch for a new project in East Croydon that happened to be called <coughs> Ruskin Square. The developer branded it with that, and so the developer probably wishes they never had done, because every single time we want to justify our next move, we're able to refer to the Ruskin, and luckily, Ruskin drew so much, and he wrote so much, that everything can be justified. It's all there. So, um, yeah, they called it Ruskin, and we started to just pick pick up on um, that, that naming, which just came from the fact that Ruskin's grandmother had a pup. That's, that really is his entire connection to, um, to central Croydon. And Croydon is a place which 
you know, as Nigel describes in some of his projects, which had a narrative attached to it, Brave New Croydon. But it was a narrative which didn't quite stick on its own, so it came with grants for offices to move their, their offices from the city of London to Croydon, which they did. And so for a brief moment, this sort of constructed reality came, but the grants stopped and they all left. And so when we were commissioned, um, things were bleaker on a, a 24 hectare site where a developer not wishing to be sort of stuck with anything had knocked everything down except for one tree and a little radical theatre in the corner. And so we went to Ruskin, good old Ruskin, and the value of close looking and observation to propose to them that in the bleak blank time of waiting for development, that Ruskin's adage that life is wealth would be well looked up into, described every weed and made the um, landscape into a garden defined by this, a skinny path that took in territories and ended with, um, again, a detail. I was sitting next to somebody and she told me how the parks of, of um, Croydon were covered in sellotape. When I next went to Croydon, I looked. It's true, they're covered in sellotape. And they're covered in sellotape because if you take a tennis ball and you wrap it in sellotape, it turns into a cricket ball. And there's two groups that like playing cricket. Young Afghani men, who um, the uh, Refugee Council work with, mm -hmm. and who now have some teams. And also, luckily enough, one of the partners of Stanhope, PLC developers. And so that's why finding these kind of shared territories of reference, like cricket, <coughs> means that your path can end in two full-size um, practice nets. And the, the warming up of a place, of taking care of it, of um, occupying it, can also be the opening of a conversation. So this, we're in year six now, and piece by piece, we're working on a public realm scheme, which is full of compromise. And sometimes we fall below the line of that first image. The um, cricket nets are now gone. They were there for two and a half years. And um, a new, um, more formalized public space is there. We um, built a route from the station. And around that route were fragments of landscape directly referring to Ruskin's drawings. So here's the, here's the garden. There's the cricket nets. There's the path. There's our failure to save the theatre, the failures. There's the chestnut tree left on site, and here the trees being bought new again, a kind of instant fabrication of time. Here are Ruskin's drawings of the value of the imperfect. Here is the tree that we went and bought from the edge of a plantation where it was more beaten by the wind, so it's in a perfect state of imperfection. And why? Because like the pink chair, to have something that you say is extremely important can make territory for other things to be brought in. So this is, um, this is what the construction hoardings are like. They always come with places to sit and planting that will be sacrificial. Here's the mountain. Again, endlessly literal, endlessly literal endlessly literal and um, we're just going to the last space which of course is oval because um, Ruskin's drawing class was oval so the last public space is a drawing room with the um, belief that drawing holds those two positions as both being a place of um, genteel retreat but also um, danger and we hope in some very small ways we've um, achieved that. And I'm going to show you the project, I'm not going to show you because I'm keeping to time. But again, this thing of the drawing out might be 750 people doing an archaeological dig to find um, the traces of a history
which is then appropriated particularly for the 21st of February where 5,000 people come to um, celebrate the martyrdom of some Bengali poets. So that idea of spaces having successional identities, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.